Next, ReachMD's special series, Focus on Diabetes. This month, we're taking an in-depth look at diabetes, the disease now affecting nearly 1 in 10 Americans. Tune in all this month for the latest research, treatments, and prevention methods to gain new insights for your practice. What causes diabetic macular edema, and how is it currently being treated? Welcome to our special Focus on Diabetes on ReachMD. I'm your host, Dr. Bruce Bloom, and joining us to discuss the etiology and treatment of diabetic macular edema is Dr. Mary Elizabeth Hartnett, Professor of Ophthalmology in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Dr. Hartnett is an ophthalmologist with a subspecialty in vitreoretinal retinal surgery and disease research. Dr. Hartnett, welcome to Reach MD. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your clinical practice and your research endeavors at University of North Carolina. I see patients with vitro-retinal diseases, including diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, retinopathy of prematurity, and surgical diseases like retinal detachment, trauma, those kinds of clinical problems. And then I also have a laboratory that's NIH-funded where I study basic mechanisms of diseases associated with angiogenesis. And actually, those also include diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy of prematurity, and neovascular age-related macular degeneration. Diabetic macular edema fit into that realm of treatment? It does because one of the growth factors that is so important in angiogenic or neovascular diseases of the retina also seems to play a role in diabetic macular edema, and that growth factor is vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. And this VEGF factor, how does it work and what does it do that causes this diabetic macular edema, or at least what do we think? We think it plays a role by being a permeability factor. So VEGF is important in causing blood vessels to leak. And leaky blood vessels, that's part of what occurs when patients develop vision loss from diabetic macular edema. So what's going on with macular edema on a gross level when you're looking in the eye? And what's going on on a molecular level? And how do those two create each other? If you look into the macula of a patient with diabetic macular edema, you'll see possibly several features. One, there can be dilation of the retinal capillaries. The retina normally would have capillaries to supply it. So there can be dilation of those capillaries as well as what we call microaneurysms. And there may be cysts that are present in the retina. So these can be appreciated by looking with biomicroscopy. We use a slit lamp to do this. And by using a thin line of light, which will show us that the thickness of the retina is increased. And then we also see exudates. And exudates are deposits of lipids and proteins that normally circulate in the bloodstream, but leak out into the retina. And as the retina, its own cells reabsorb fluid from the edema, these exudates become more apparent. And what kind of problem does that cause in vision? It causes a reduction in the central vision. That's what the macula gives a function for. And are there differences between type 1 diabetics and type 2 diabetics in the incidence of how often this happens or the severity or the treatment? We tend to see macular edema more frequently in type 2 diabetics than we do in type 1 diabetics. But it is a disease that occurs after diabetes has been around usually for a longer duration. And is there a reason from the etiology of those two diseases that might say we'd expect it more in type 2 diabetic than we would in a type 1 diabetic? I suspect that it's related to age-related changes that may occur as well. Diabetic macular edema has also been associated with lipid dysfunctions and with anemia. So it's possible that those conditions are more frequent in the elderly population. On average, what percentage of diabetics would you say manifest this kind of diabetic macular edema? If I think of my own population of patients, I would say most diabetics who come into my office have macular edema. But based on epidemiologic studies, and that's really the best way to get at that answer, it's thought that about 28 to 30 percent of patients who have diabetes have macular edema once they've had the diabetes for about 20 years duration. And are there other factors about them that contribute to the chance that they're going to get this disease? If only a quarter to a third of them have it, do they have any other risk factors 
You mentioned lipid issues. Are there other things besides that? What is important is control of the blood sugar and the blood pressure. So in general, progression of retinopathy, we don't have a cure for diabetic retinopathy or diabetic macular edema, but progression of retinopathy can be slowed by having better glucose control. And so we strive to have the hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of the average of the blood glucose over the last three months. We strive to have that seven or under. And then also good control of the blood pressure. There have been several studies done. The DCCT Diabetic Control and Complications Trial, as well as a multicenter clinical trial done in Europe that have shown that good glycemic control and good control of blood pressure help to slow down the progression of diabetic retinopathy. So let's turn our attention now to the treatment of this disease. Currently, there's two sort of standard treatments or treatments that physicians will use to treat this. Can you tell us what they are and how they're different? Probably the standard of care treatment and what's been tried and true is focal laser treatment for diabetic macular edema. And in this, a laser, usually of wavelength green, like 532 nanometer or in the spectrum for green light, is used to cauterize the leaky blood vessels or to provide a light grid over the area of diffuse leaking in the macula. And that causes the blood vessels to become cauterized and to stop leaking. It also is thought to lead to renewal of the retinal pigment epithelium, whose function partly is to pump out fluid from the macula to the choroidal circulation beneath it. If you've just tuned in, you're listening to our special focus on diabetes on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Bruce Bloom, and joining us to discuss the etiology and treatment of diabetic macular edema is Dr. Mary Elizabeth Hartnett, professor of ophthalmology in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So the first treatment and the standard of care right now is the laser treatment. What's the other treatment that physicians are using? Anecdotally, physicians sometimes use intravitreal triamcinolone injections where triamcinolone is a steroid. It's injected into the vitreous cavity and has anecdotally been associated with reduction in swelling and improvement in vision in patients with diabetic macular edema. But we recently have results from a clinical trial that when it compared triamcinolone to laser, showed that in the long term, at least after two years of follow-up, that the patients who had laser treatment were more likely to have improvement in vision and to have fewer side effects than those patients treated with triamcinolone. And what do you think the next research is going to show us, or what are we going to look at with the laser and other treatments to see if we can improve the outcome for patients? We're very interested in whether combinations of therapies may be useful, and we're enrolling patients in a clinical trial supported by the Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network to compare patients who are treated with laser only to patients treated with laser and triamcinolone to patients treated with laser and ranibizumab, which is an antibody, basically, that blocks the biologic action of vascular endothelial growth factor. And in that study, is there any reason why you would try one first and then the second or the third one? Um, Do you use the steroid first and then the laser at the same time or the laser first and then the steroid? Is there mechanism of action leading us to think there might be a, a reason for doing it in some particular order? The idea might be, for example, to use the injection first to reduce the swelling. And in one way, that may make the laser delivery more accurate and safer because the retina would not be distorted when we're giving laser treatment. So tell us what the action is of the steroid inside the eye. What does it actually do that might decrease that swelling and help us to be more accurate with the laser? The steroid works probably in a number of different ways. For example, it reduces inflammation in the eye, and there's more and more evidence that inflammation plays a role in diabetic macular edema and diabetic retinopathy. For example, one way is that there may be increase in adhesion molecules and increase in the white blood cells sticking to the endothelial cells of the blood vessels. And this can then trigger pathways that lead to the actual death of the endothelial cell and disruption of the natural barriers that prevent leakage of fluid into the macula. So there may be one way that the triamcinolone may reduce the amount of white blood cells sticking 
to the retinal vessels. Some of this research, though, probably most of this research has been done not in humans, so it's a little bit of a stretch, and we can't make definite conclusions based on the research. Another way is that the triamcinolone may actually interfere with the pathway of vascular endothelial growth factor, either by destabilizing the messenger RNA of that or by other mechanisms. How exactly does the laser treatment work? We think the laser is at a wavelength that can be absorbed by certain pigments within the eye. And in the case of, say, treating a microaneurysm, which would be an outpouching of a retinal vessel, it would be absorbed by hemoglobin in the blood. And then the absorption of the light gets it changed to heat where it can actually photocoagulate or cause coagulation of the proteins. And it seals off in a sense, melts, seals off, coagulates the proteins so that there's less leakage there. So that's one way that it may work. It also, it's speculative, but there is some evidence that it can be absorbed by the melanin of the retinal pigment epithelium, which is the monolayer of cells deep to the retina, and that somehow it stimulates a healing process where other cells that are more competent and healthier can grow in and replace the injured cells and be able to perform the function better of pumping out fluid. And also, they have a barrier function as well that prevents fluid from the choroidal circulation from getting into the retina. Do diabetics ever completely lose their vision from diabetic macular edema? The macula is very important for the central vision, the reading vision, the vision that we use to recognize people's faces. And if macular edema is severe enough, diabetic patients can lose that central vision. But the macula isn't the only part of the retina that gives vision. So usually they still retain ambulatory vision or side vision. The treatments we're talking about, are they also used for age-related macular degeneration? Ranibizumab is used for age-related macular degeneration currently, and there have been clinical trials that have shown that it's effective in stopping the leakage from choroidal neovascularization that grows in neovascular AMD and improving the visual acuity. Triamcinolone has been used in some trials with photodynamic therapy, which is another type of treatment for macular degeneration, and there is also another form of steroid anacortave acetate, which is in trials to test the effect long-term on preventing choroidal neovascularization from recurring. I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Mary Elizabeth Hartnett, Professor of Ophthalmology in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, for joining us to discuss the etiology and treatment of diabetic macular edema. You've been listening to our special focus on diabetes, on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. For a complete program guide and podcasts, visit www.reachmd.com. And thank you for listening. You've been listening to this month's special series, Focus on Diabetes. For a program guide and complete list of shows, please visit us at reachmd.com.